Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. This webinar is held in connection with the launch of the second edition of the Smart City Index. The topic for discussion this evening is, can technology protect the well-being of citizens in a pandemic? Now, we have as panelists this evening, the Foreign Minister of Singapore, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, who is also the Minister of the Smart Nation Office Initiative. The Mayor of Helsinki, Mr. Jan Valpavuri, who has been many times cabin a Cabinet Minister. Mr. Bruno Langvan, the President of the Urban Observatory, and Professor Arturo Briss, Director of the World Competitiveness Center of IMD. And I'm your moderator, Chen Hing Chi. Let me call on Bruno to kick off by talking about the Smart City Index project and the rankings. Bruno. Thank you, Professor Chan. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, today marks the launch of the second edition of the Smart City Index, which is a cooperative endeavor between IMD and uh, SUTD in Singapore. And uh, we are very proud to uh, present the second edition. The um, uh, 2020 uh, index covers 109 cities, which is seven more than uh, last year, uh, from all parts of the, uh, of the world. Um, and its philosophy remains the same. That is to balance what technology can bring to smart cities versus what people can bring to smart cities. So uh, in that context, we see the uh, podium uh, emerging again uh, this year, very close to uh, what we had uh, last year. That is Singapore uh, at the top, followed by Helsinki and Zurich third. And these were the three country cities we had last year at the top as well. The, the top 10 also includes other uh, parts of the world like Auckland in, uh, uh, in New Zealand, like uh, many Nordic cities, including Oslo, Copenhagen, um, and also New York uh, at, as number 10. So we have large cities, medium cities, smaller cities. Um, as we expected, uh, the variety of experiences translates into this this ranking. Uh, what is important to keep in mind is that um, the uh, Smart City Index aims at being global. So we want it to be a tool for action. We want it to be of use, not just for the, the champions, not just for the Singapore's and Helsinki's of this world, but also in the uh, middle of Africa, Latin America, or other parts of Asia and the Pacific, where Smart City is very often more a dream than a reality, where people are striving to acquire the technology and to adapt their own structures to what could be the future of, of cities. And in that sense, um, we see that movements uh, are taking place in the middle of the ranking, at the bottom of the ranking. So there are very interesting stories to, uh, to tell, just looking at the, the data uh, included in the index. These data are of two kinds. Uh, on one hand, we have typically technology-related data, which we could call the, the hard data. And this is combined with a large amount and quite unique set of set of soft data, uh, which are gathered through surveys. Uh, typically, 120 people are surveyed in each of the 109 countries. So that's more than, than 10,000 uh, altogether. And um, we combine those into a number of um, areas. Uh, we look at infrastructure, we look at health, we look at uh, safety, we look at governance. So all these elements combined give the rankings that uh, are in front of you. But uh, the report is not limited to rankings. We try to look at ways in which this data can be translated into action. And this year, like last year, a certain number of key messages emerge. One of them is that in addition to technology, which of course remains a core component uh, of being a smart city, uh, leadership uh, is critically important. 
the ability for local governments uh, to imprint uh, appetite for what smart cities could deliver, combined to their own ability to bring society together, to make people feel that they are part of building the smart city and that there is benefits for them as citizens uh, coming out of these efforts is critically important. So it's somehow uh, technology plus leadership that makes uh, a difference. Um, the uh, uh, typical aspect uh, that uh, the uh, index covers uh, are very broad and apply, of course, to uh, the particular uh, crisis that uh, the world is going through. So Arturo is going to say a few words about, uh, about that, but I would just like to, to flag the fact that it is probably too early uh, to analyze whether smart cities um, will be uh, or have been able to, to face the crisis, but indicators show that indeed a number of very positive uh, elements have been shaped in, uh, in smart cities that we have not seen uh, much uh, otherwise. Um, uh, the, the final lesson, and I shall stop here, that we see from uh, these rankings is that uh, what's happening in Africa uh, is very different from what's happening in Latin America, which is itself very different from is what's happening in Asia or Europe or North America. Uh, in other words, there's more than one way to be smart. And uh, the way in which we intend to pursue this work is to uh, improve the methodology year after year and listen, uh, hear reactions and see how we can improve uh, the ways in which we can make this index uh, closer to a tool for action. Uh, so let's be smart. Uh, let's continue to do it in a very diverse uh, way. And again, I look forward to uh, our discussion today. Well, I'm going to call on Arturo. Before I do that, I would like to remind the audience with us that you have a chance to pose questions. Just feed it into the Q&A and also in the chat if you feel like it. But Q&A is easier for me to read. Arturo, would you like to add something? Yes, very briefly. Very briefly, obviously, this year's rankings come in the middle of the world. Uh, pandemic, and we are not uh, ignorant to the fact that the the quality of the technology in a city has to be related as well to how citizens fare in the in the context of this pandemic. And we do find certainly that cities that rank highest, like Helsinki, Zurich, uh, Singapore itself, of course, they have been also doing much better when it comes to finding the impact of the pandemic on people. Uh, but we see two important results this year. First of all. Uh, technology is only marginal. That is, given certain conditions in the city, then technology can only add some positive effects, but it's not all of it. Example, New York this year ranks number 10. Uh, for many, this may be surprising because New York also has been one of the cities most affected and most touched by the pandemic. So obviously there are other infrastructures, health, participation of people, uh, income equality, in the city that make New York suffer despite its technology. On the contrary, for example, we have cities like Seoul that ranks uh, in a 60th position in the ranking this year, who has seen a very mild impact of COVID-19 in its citizens, yet is not as smart as Singapore is, for example. So the, the, the main point that we want to make this year is that technology only provides added value. And second, and then technology is then more valuable for less developed cities. African cities or Latin American cities much more than in Singapore or in Zurich. Thank you, Arturo. Now, I would like to come and ask questions to the two people on the panel which really manage, you know, and they run cities, they run, help run countries. So I'm going to start with Minister Balakrishnan. Uh, Minister, uh, Singapore and Helsinki have done very well and you have Singapore is number one, Helsinki is number two. Can you tell us what smart technologies Singapore used to deal with the pandemic? And is a lockdown essential? And finally, also part of it, between leadership and technology, you've heard this mentioned now, what weight would you put to either 
in coming through for the pandemic. Thank you, Hing Chi. That's, that's not one question. That's a whole series, a whole barrage. Of and Yang, you should take note. That's for you too. <laughs> <laughs> to be prepared, yeah. Well, first, I want to thank IMD, both Bruno and Arturo, for this uh, privilege of being here, and of course, for the honor of uh, your assessment of Singapore's position in the ranking. So, thank you very much. But um, as you have self alluded to, it's not about technology in isolation or technology for its own sake. I think Bruno m m made the point it's about technology and citizens, and the role that leadership plays in bringing these two together in order to achieve positive outcomes. So to answer your question, Heng Chi, rather than make this a technical discussion on technological platforms, I thought I would just highlight three attributes of this interaction between technology and citizens. Very quickly, from my point of view, first attribute is inclusion. When this uh, pandemic broke out and you assume that, well, in Singapore, every home has got fiber, we've got more mobile phones than people, you realize that not every single person has a smartphone. And you realize that although we have subsidies for broadband access and for computers, we did not have one computer for every child. And suddenly, because of when schools were closed and you got homeschooling, you've got to close these gaps. So the first point I want to make is that for all cities, regardless of whatever you're aiming for, digital inclusion is essential. The second attribute is on what I call citizen centricity. You know, we, we all run governments and we love to have departments, departments have services and everyone you know, certainly on the provider side of it, looks at it from our side of provision of services. But to the citizens, they're not interested in the detailed organization of government. They just, they have needs and they want us to meet their needs. And so the ability to use this as an exercise to re-engineer government, re-engineer the delivery of services, re-engineer even the process of approvals and licenses, that's where I believe value is derived and provided for citizens. In, if you use the, this pandemic as an example, well, people wanted to know information. And they didn't want to have to decide, do I go to the Ministry of Health or do I go to a hospital or whatever? They just need information, general information, as well as specific information for themselves. So citizen centricity. My third and final point is that this pandemic has highlighted the need for trust and transparency. We have been incredibly blessed to have great engineers who came up with a design for contact tracing, which respects privacy. But you know, the fundamental ingredient is trust. Because if people don't trust the systems and the people operating the systems, they won't comply, they won't cooperate, and you can't achieve the level of protection that you need. And the final point on trust is also related to transparency. Again, to use the example of contact tracing in Singapore, we open source the software, we open source the hardware so that everyone can take a look. The experts can review it in detail and say, aha, no back doors, no secret recipes. What you see is what you get and it will be used for the purpose that is put forth. So, I, the, these three attributes of always going for inclusion, meetings, making citizens the center of the universe, and ensuring trust and transparency. That, that to me, are the key attributes when we decide on platforms and technologies to deploy. Thanks, Hingchi. Thank you, Minister. We'll the, uh, uh, the mayor, you know, uh, Helsinki is in the north, different. Uh, Helsinki is the north. Different. But is your experience somewhat like Singapore? What technologies did you use and... Uh, Leadership technology, what weight do you give? Oh, yeah, muted. Yeah, no, no, no. Thank, thank you, thank you very much for this. It's a great honor to to have the chance to join you today, and it's also a great honor for the city of Helsinki to be ranked that well in this important ranking. Um, I'd like to start by telling that actually I could have said everything what Minister Balakrishnan just said. 
I could I, I agree with everything he said, and actually my my opening remarks are very much in line what what he said. But let me put it in 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 some other words. My first point is that. There can always be leadership without technology, but there can't be technology without leadership. So finally, uh, technology is, is, is only a tool. And then it's the question, maybe the most important question is how we are able to utilize that tool. The second point is that it's an important tool. Uh, in today's world, we are, or the whole world is discussing how the pandemic is changing the world. It certainly will change the world, but I'm sure that new technologies, digitalization, are changing the world more and more profoundly. And they did it already before the pandemic, and they will do it even after the pand pand pandemic. So even for me, it, it's not a, a question about single technologies. It is about understanding that smart technologies are essential and, and they will be that even more in the future in like everything we do, everything cities do. Then I would also like to come with like three attributes or three angles, uh, very much in line what with, with what the uh, minister just mentioned. The first one is, for, first one is, and I think that is maybe the main reasons why Helsinki is ranked that well, is that smart cities can only be based on smart people. They can only be based on educated people and they can only be based on a society where it's, it's not about the question how well the elite has been educated, but how well the, the people in average has been educated. And I mean, there is a, a certainly a correlation between the fact that Helsinki and Singapore are also excellent ranked uh, when you uh, compare education systems in the world yes. and then smart cities. The second one is about mindset. I think something which is also uh, uh, similar in, in, in Singapore and in Helsinki, that uh, we, uh, we are early adapters. Uh, we are like curious people. Uh, we, we trust the society. Uh, we trust the authorities. Uh, uh, that, that we are, and that's why we are willing to use and utilize technologies, what the society they, provides us. Then the third point, and my last one is that you need to understand that everything counts, everything matters. A good or smart city is a city with few weaknesses and, and many strengths. I mean, if you are able to utilize smart technologies in your traffic system, it's of course good. But if at the same time, you are not able to do that in your hospitals or, or in your education system, it do not take you that long. So my three points, it's based on smart people. It's based on right attitude, which can only be based on trust. And the third one is that it's, it's finally a leadership question and leadership the cornerstone of a leadership in a smart city is based on a comprehensive approach and holistic view. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're, all, we're off to a very good start. And we do have quite a few questions that have been posed to us, you know. And uh, I would like, oh, here's one question, which is, um, yeah, I think it may be from China. Uh, quite a few have asked this. Last year, Zhuhai was China's top-ranked smart city at number 40. Now it's dropped to 62. I would be interested to understand why China, which leads on smart city investments and deployments, has no city that ranks higher than 62. Over to you, Arthur. I definitely need to take that, that question because it pertains to ranking themselves. So it is true that Chinese cities rank uh, between the 60th and the 100th position. And we rank many of them, uh, Zhuhai, but Tianjin, Chongqing, Hanzhou, Shenzhen, and several others. Uh, one of the problems with Chinese cities is that while technology is at the forefront, it very often fails to solve citizens' problems, which is at the core of our ranking. That is, our ranking tries to assess not only the quality of the city's infrastructure in technology, but also to what extent that infrastructure solves people's problems. So, as Major Rafa mentioned earlier, you can have fantastic traffic control cameras, 
but if you don't resolve traffic problems, then that technology becomes useless. So that's what we see in Chinese cities. Uh, the perception of citizens is that, for example, hyperconnectivity may have some uh, issues related to privacy, or that traffic control, indeed traffic control apps, do not resolve traffic problems. The second problem with Chinese cities is their size. Remember, we highlighted that last year. Typically, the smartest cities tend to be small or mid-sized. We have fantastic examples here with Helsinki, Singapore, also Zurich, or some of the cities that rank in the top 10. So the problem with Chinese cities is that because they are mega cities, it is extremely difficult to spread all the benefits of technology to every single citizen. And then there is a big issue of unfairness and inequality, which can only be resolved by focusing on smaller uh, population uh, population groups, okay, and on the smaller cities at the end of the day. This is the reason. Thank you. Thank you, Arturo. Now, I'm going, there are quite a lot of questions, so let me just try to go through some of them and to get the panelists and certainly the mayor and the minister to give their answers because I think they are practitioners and people want to hear them. Can you give an example of public-private partnership for smart cities and where this works with, particularly with the pandemic. Uh, would uh, Jan or Minister Balakrishna care to answer? I think this certainly goes to Singapore. Thank you. <laughs> well, if you think about it, when cities had lockdowns or variety of circuit breakers, immediately everyone's priority was supplies. And in certainly in the case of Singapore, the fact that we have a reasonably well-developed uh, uh, e-retailing sector, food deliveries and the rest of it help. But again, here the point is to make sure that the technology is accessible to everyone and no one gets left behind, no one is excluded because they're not connected at the same time that you've got security of payment systems, you've got trust that when some an order is placed, that person, there's a real person on the other side of it, the credit risk and all those are taken care of. So that's just one example how, you know, things which you assume you could allow to develop in the fullness of time, in fact, became urgent and critical during a crisis. If I may, I could come with an other kind of angle. Yes. Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't think that we in, in Helsinki are that good in, in, in traditional public-private partnerships. But for us, the philosophy of, of, of creating the city as a, a platform, for, um, te as a testbed for, for pilots and demonstrations is an important one. So just to give you one example, we have... A, one among the most advanced 3D models covering the whole city, which is uh, for free use for every, any single company who could just think about uh, uh, how, how to utilize it. I mean, and then we have a huge amount of companies all the way from urban planning to, 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 to event organizers, which are actually innovating using our 3D model as, as a platform. So, uh, that is the way uh, we are encouraging and are helping uh, the private companies to innovate and create innovations and even test them in a city of a, you could say, optimal size before then trying to, to reach uh, bigger cities in the world. Thank you. Yes. Right. Now, here is quite a question. Is there a good example of using technology to prevent corruption of public officials? Uh, this is for the panel, you know, Arturo, Bruno, Jan, Vivian, Minister. Well, I think corruption is... I may, uh... Oh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Would you like to go first, Bruno, or Minister? Uh, uh, no, I was going to, to refer to... Uh, uh, other works, the, uh, because I spent 10, 10 years at the World Bank and uh, we tried in many ways uh, to address this question. And um, the um, you know, corruption is, uh, is like innovation or uh, it's a state of mind. That is, if you want to fight corruption, 
you have to do it at all levels. Of course, the people think of high-level government officials because they are the more visible. But corruption becomes a very big problem when it starts to pervade the whole society, when you cannot you know, get your kids in school, you cannot uh, sit for an exam or take a driver's license without being some bribe. This is where corruption becomes uh, a nationwide issue. And, and smart cities and technology have a very big role to play. But very often these roles are not as sophisticated as one could think. Uh, for instance, if uh, you use electronic platforms uh, for public procurement, you diminish a lot uh, of the mechanisms that lead to corruption. Um, if you equip customs officer with more computers and make sure that every single transaction is duplicated for so three, four, five different, uh, different positions, uh, of course, you cut down a number of mechanisms that happen very often only face to face. Smart cities, because there are some, somehow a neural network. You try to connect citizens with their officials, can play a big role because they enhance uh, transparency. But we should not forget that very often, the best remedies are, remedies are not necessarily very highly sophisticated ones. Right. Minister, corruption and... Well, I wanted to agree with Bruno. It reminds me of a saying, you know, we have that uh, corruption is a fact of life, but you must not let it become a way of life. If you stop to think about it, it's a fact of life because it is a clear and present danger in all societies. And what you're trying to achieve by great effort is to make sure it doesn't become endemic, it doesn't become accepted, it doesn't become a way of life. This question on technology and corruption is interesting because in fact, sometimes if you go to certain places, and you say, I'm going to devise this system. It's all electronic, all transparent. Everything is clear. The, you know, all the accounting is evident. And you realize the person is looking past you and saying, no, I don't want that because it affects their way of doing things. So that's the first thing is mindset and values. It's not a technical question. It's a values and social and political question. Second point, of course, is that technology does make it easier to shine bright lights in very transparent systems and to reduce the avenues for all this kind of activities. So that is helpful. Another example is that even when you've got transparent procurement systems, you know, cooks are always trying to get ahead of it. They're creating shell companies, complex supply chain webs. But even this is another avenue where the appropriate deployment of artificial intelligence, pattern recognitions, you're able to quickly, or at least reasonably quickly, identify these unusual patterns, unusual interconnections, and deal with it. So again, this is an example where it's not technology for its own sake, it's first the values underlying your system, and then deploying it in a smart way. Anyone else wants to comment? I'm coming from Finland, which has been ranked as the least corrupted country in the world for several times, yes. I think. In the, in the last one, we were maybe number two after Norway. I, I fully agree with what the, the Minister Malakrishnan said. I mean, we have a good track record in, in, in fighting corruption and, as, as said, a quite successful one. And, and for me, it's quite difficult to find any example of, of any kind of technology which has actually helped us. I mean, in the future, certainly, yes. I agree with the, the potential with the artificial intelligence, especially. But it, it's about a, a, a mindset, values. And for us, maybe the most important single factor in fighting, fighting corruption has been transparency. So, I mean, everything is transparent. That is the... the best way to, to fight uh, fight that phenomenon. And just to give you an example, I mean, every single receipt I provide is a public document. My daily calendar is a, a, a public document in, in Finland. And then whomsoever is asking for uh, what I did uh, last first day between 2 and 3 p.m. Uh, if I have, a, have had an official meeting, I mean, we are responsible to answer that question and actually the media also asks that kind of questions and that is uh, it's it's a long way and it's also very much linked to the the, the question of trust 
So uh, if you are able to create trust, then you are also able to, to, to fight corruption. Right. Um, oh, can I move to another question? This is on vaccine multilateralism. The question is directed to Minister Vivian, but I think the others can also you know, have their say if they want it. The question is, uh, explain vaccine multilateralism. And in fact, uh, will it benefit cities? The benefit will occur according to whether cities are smart or the level of smartness of the cities. Well, so just let me try it. A vaccine multilateralism and whether the benefits accrue according to whether cities are and the levels of smartness, I guess. Well, stop to think about the nature of a pandemic. By definition, I must have been infected by someone and I may infect someone else. If this chain is broken, the pandemic ends. That's the fundamental nature. So if you think about it this way, and you will immediately understand the only way I'm going to be safe is if everyone else is safe. And that's the fundamental perspective behind vaccine multilateralism. That it's not enough to just secure your own people, your own border, you can't restart and get back to some form of normalcy unless everyone in the world is safe. Now, having said that as an ideal, there are political realities. People legitimately expect leaders to prioritize their citizens. And I think we all have an obligation. Citizenship has its privileges. But it's important to go beyond that and to realize that we live in a world, a very diverse world, big cities, small cities, well-developed, less developed. And the only way we're going to make it safe for every one of us is to make sure everyone has the benefit of the protection. So in the case of Singapore, we do believe in vaccine multilateralism. We support the WHO. We support the COVAX facility. We believe that even with this enormous effort you know, we, we will break world records in terms of developing vaccines, but there's no guarantee that the first will necessarily be the best. There is no guarantee of long lasting immunity. We have to hedge our bets and we have to look and protect each other. That's why we subscribe to what the, the WHO is doing into the COVAX facility. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you want to say something, Arturo? Yes, very briefly, because I completely agree. I think that one of the aspects that are ranking highlight this year is that with COVID-19, there is a new type of globalization. I think that we need to work together for some new global issues like pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, there is a deglobalization in that local policies and city policies become more important. And that's, I think, something that we have been trying to address in the last two years when we released this ranking. I think countries are becoming less important in favor of cities and local policies. Within large countries, China or the United States or France, you cannot anymore talk about country policies. And for this pandemic, we need global agreements and alliances to come up with vaccines, but then local policies to deal with the pandemic. And I think the two cities that we have today here represented are fantastic examples. So this is an interesting new trend of deglobalization, moving much more into local politics. Jan, any comment? I fully agree with what Arthur said. I think that we are moving to a direction where both the local and global uh, play a, a bigger role. It's, it's more and more a co competition between cities and regions uh, instead of, of countries in, in the world today. And also the fight against pandemic. I mean, it's in the grassroots level in cities uh, and in, in some cases in regions where you either manage or do not manage to, to, to fight the, the pandemic. But at the same time, we understand even better how interconnected the world is and how dependent we are from each other. I mean, Helsinki and Finland, we have been extremely good in fighting the pandemic. And, and um, the, the figures for, for us are really, really low ones. But still, we have suffered economically hugely due to the fact that we are so dependent on international trade. And if the rest of the world is, is not feeling well, it, it causes a, a, a huge headache also for us. Right. Yeah. Well, the, 
Let me move to another question. And this one is not to do with the pandemic, but it has to do with smart cities. And I think it's quite, a, it requires quite a bit of thought. If you were to build a greenfield smart city, how would you go about it? And how would you avoid congestion and bottlenecks? So you can start from a clean slate. Uh, the academics will have an idea of how to build a smart city, but uh, the practitioners, if you were to be given this slate, how would you begin to build a smart city? Would, uh, can, I, can I ask a very brief question? Yes, yes to, Arturo, uh, you want to try first and then we'll give it to Let, let me start for, 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 for what you have found out in the ranking. I think that the best way to start is by identifying what is the key issue in each city. Okay, so if the city starts from scratch developing a smart city strategy, I think we need to see what is the big concern of people. And we have seen, for example, in Colombian cities, the main issue is safety and security. In, uh, in UK cities, the main issue is mobility. In American cities, the main issue is hyperconnectivity. Uh, in Paris, the big issue is traffic, as it is in Moscow. So once you have identified the big issue, then you have to put technology to just solve that problem. That would be the, would be, would be the starting point. The mistake is to start with the technology itself. You know, wow, let's bring the best technology from the best provider to make our city uh, smart. You know, smartness is about, about linking needs with technologies. It's about solving problems, yeah. The uh, minister, would you care to join? It's a profound question. Of, you know, yeah, it's a very profound question. In yeah, fact, right. uh, I think it goes to, there were some questions which were, how do you define smart? Two, three questions I've seen. Uh, how do you define smart? Yes. Well, so, so I would say it's a profound question. It's worth thinking through in detail. And, but, and I can't give it full justice, but let me just give you my reaction to it. And I must admit, it's also informed by a recent closure of a project uh, on another smart city where they were trying to design it from green fields. Mm. So my suggestion would be don't think, don't start on that basis. Start with why is it for the first time in human history, more than half of humanity lives in cities. And this happened not because of planning, not because of government mandate, but because people were in search of certain key ingredients, jobs, food, water, security, opportunities, culture, education, and then all the meta structures that are built on top of that. So I think it's important to understand that it is about people and people's needs. And technology is a tool, it's an evolving tool and whether it's smart or not is whether you have deployed it appropriately to meet those needs in a way which, and I'll go back to my starting point, to deploy technology in a way that it is inclusive, that it is fair, it addresses the direct needs of people and not the needs of the providers, and that you build a high trust society. A high trust society is also one where you've got lower transaction costs. And then you get a virtuous cycle set up. A fair and just society with hope, with confidence, with high trust and the ability to get things done, to meet its own needs, and then to build a network. So you, there's been talk about you know, whether the center of gravity will be the nation state or city states or cities. I think the world in the future will consist of a network of cities competing collaborating, creating new structures, providing new services. That's the future we need to look forward to. And there'll be a future with great diversity. And even that competition and that complex competition and cooperation uh, will have very interesting outcomes. So it's a very interesting time in human history. It is. It is. Yeah? Um, maybe I would like to start by saying that first you should choose a location which is climate-wise more lucrative than Helsinki is. <laughs> but, but, but actually, to be honest, we also used to say that 
being one of the most innovative countries in the world that that if you are able to create something which works in our climate circumstances, it certainly works everywhere. So you could also see that as a strength, not, not as a weakness. Uh, but they may be a little bit more serious point. Uh, uh, I used to say that uh, everything which can be digitalized will be digitalized, but everything which can be digitalized can also be copied. What you can't copy is human interaction between clever and innovative people. And there, it's even better if those people come from different sectors and different cultures. So I would start the 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 the, the creation of a a, a greenfield uh, smart city by by guaranteeing that it's a, a multicultural city from the very beginning. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know there have been a couple of questions, and I don't want to seem like I'm avoiding difficult questions, but Arturo. We've been asked whether the number of interviews taken, 120, is sufficient, you know, to get a good feel of smartness in the city. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as a statistician, obviously, the answer is that it's always not about the size of the sample, but about the rep representativeness of the sample. Uh, and what we wanted to do from the beginning is to target not public officials, not to target business executives, but to target citizens. And in that sense, it's a random sample. We believe that is representative enough, and you know it's in line with other international organizations. And we can improve, and we could try to do better. But um, we also try to make it as as reliable as possible. So we we work on this constantly to make sure that our sample is representative. Uh, thank you. Uh, now uh, we are running. Uh, it's 8.45, but can I just run for one more question? I think uh, I'll try and sneak this in. We've been talking of governance, technology, and so on. So I'm just putting this question in. Do you think urban governance will change with the prolific use of technology? And this technology and the digitalization of society has been enhanced and in fact, accelerated because of you know the present context of the pandemic. But will how will urban governance change? I guess this question is for the two practitioners. Again, another profound question. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> Mr. Minister, I'm please. I'm to, to say, uh, it's probably a biased view. That, you know, it's the difference between mayors and the president. President of a large continental size economy versus being a mayor of a city. And uh, at the risk of being politically incorrect, but many people say the mayor tends to be more practical. He's based on the ground. He has to face the people directly. He's got to meet needs and he's got to meet needs immediately in real time. And I think there's something to be said about scale. And I know in technology and certainly in internet time, everyone talks about scale and assumes that, you know, we'll be one big global metropolis. When in fact, it may be about getting the scale, right? Getting the organizational and institutional structures, right? Getting the processes of interaction. Some people call that politics. Right. And the rules and the system design, right. And again, maybe I'm biased in coming from Singapore, having that ability to be multicultural almost as an instinct. Because from the moment you wake up, you hear different accents, you smell different food, and you know that people are praying to different gods. Uh, that ability to deal with diversity and rather than allow that to divide us, to use it as a source of inspiration. So in a paradoxical way, the future, I think, belongs to the city. Right size, right, organized the right way, and provided with appropriate leadership. And then the technology flows as a secondary factor. Thank you. Anyone wants to join? Yeah. Just want to 
echo after having myself had a opportunity to first serve the national government for seven years and now the capital as a mayor for three years, that it's a totally different job between being a, a minister or being a, a mayor of, uh, of a relatively big city. Um, and, and, and being a mayor is, is it's, it's like, it's just so much more hands-off. It's uh, hands-on. It's so much, much like operative, uh, grassroots level. I mean, you I used to say that uh, it, it's much easier to, to provide policy papers than implement them. And our job is to implement them. And, and it is just a, a totally different story. Uh, but, but coming, Zhang Heng, to your, to your original question, I mean, of course it will change. Of course the technology will also change the, the governance of, of all kinds of, of societal units. Uh, it, it will change uh, because, I mean, improving tools, of course, always uh, give uh, good leaders and, and and efficient uh, cities, countries, or nations, uh, better possibilities to, 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 to manage and govern. But it also um, exceeds the, the expectations of the people, what you should do and what you should not. It remains to be seen how it will change, but I mean, it's, it's evident because new technologies is going to change everything in the world, everything in our free time and in, in our work life, just everything. Yes, and I do feel sympathetic that, frankly, with the new technologies, you know, you always have to be on call and to answer. You know, if you answer now, you are already too late. You should have answered an hour ago. And I think technology really, uh, the prolific use of technology emphasizes higher standards, but also I think we grow more impatient as a community, as a country, you know, as a nation. But um, now we have come to 8.50 and I'm told that is when I absolutely have to stop. So on behalf of the organizers, you know, IMD, SUTD, I thank the panelists for joint speaking and sort of uh, being so engaged in a conversation and, uh, you know, uh, agreeing, disagreeing with each other. And I really thank the audience for being with us and asking such, you know, tough questions. And there are very many more questions. As I scroll down, they were really very, they were excellent questions. And some were very specialized and I wanted all four panelists to be able to come in. So forgive me for being selective, but as a moderator, I have to do that. Well, thank you very much. Good night. And thank you thank for joining you. us. Well, good night, good afternoon, good morning. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.